स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Hello, welcome back to uh, this uh, series of lectures on cultural studies, which, um, as you all know, um, is being recorded under the aegis of NPTEL or the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning, which is a joint venture by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India. We are now in uh, the second module. In fact, we have been through um, a couple of lectures uh, and discussions uh, in the second module, which is entitled Key Concepts. And uh, in the last lecture, we talked about representation, which I had mentioned uh, is not only a key concept in contemporary cultural studies, but is also you could say almost a pillar of cultural studies as we know it today, without which some of the key uh, premises or some of the key axioms of contemporary cultural studies would not uh, be articulated properly. So, today we are in um, part 2 of representation, as I had uh, mentioned in the last lecture, I would be devoting two lectures to representation. So, let us see, uh, let us have a look at what we did in the last lecture. First, we looked at the definition of representation given by Chris Barker in the Sage Dictionary of Cultural Studies. And let us look at this slide here. First, Barker says representation is a set of processes by which signifying practices appear to stand for or depict another object. Okay. So, this is one way of understanding cultural uh, sorry representation in cultural studies. For instance, you see representation as a set of processes that looks as if they stand for or they depict another object or any cultural practice. Okay? In that sense, as Barker says, representation is an act of symbolism. Why? Because the moment you begin to represent or represent something, okay, any object, any cultural practice, etcetera, what happens is you take recourse to certain symbols and those symbols usually are in the form of a language. So, this is one definition of representation, but Barker says well we have to uh, you have to go you know go beyond this this and look at representation in a slightly different way and here we look at the second uh, paragraph here. He says however, for cultural studies representation does not simply reflect now let us mark this. Okay. In the first case, we, ha we have words like stand for, depict okay, uh, through, uh, through symbolism, but he says uh, we should keep in mind that representation does not simply reflect okay, in symbolic forms, even if in language or symbolic forms, things that exist in an independent object world. Okay. So, well, if, rep if it does not, if representation does not truly reflect things, then what? Then he says, look at this, rather representations are constitutive of the meaning of that which they purport to stand for. Okay? Uh, as I mentioned in the last lecture, this is extremely important. Okay? Representations are not just you know, symb symbolic uh, reflections of meanings. The important point to note here is representations themselves are constitutive of the meaning. So, ultimately as we can see in the next slide, ultimately representation is a map of meaning as we remember we had seen we had talked about representation being 
um, a map of meaning, pointers to meaning, but the second point is what is uh, what is often reiterated by theorists and practitioners of cultural studies that is this that representation also constitutes that map. So, it is like you know the what we call the recto and verso sides of a piece of paper ok. Can you separate you know uh, the recto and the verso the both sides of a piece of paper in the same way you know the both sides are constitutive of the piece of paper ok. So, uh, in the same way um, that representation also constitutes those very maps of meaning which we say. Uh, so, it is not simply a pointer to, to meaning. Next we saw this uh, again by Barker that representation is a matter of selection and organization. Okay? Uh, we select things, okay? we select what to represent. Okay? It is often held that you cannot it is or it is well nigh impossible to uh, to represent things in their totality. So, what inheres in the whole process of representation as shown by Barker and several uh, other critics is this that there is uh, there are questions of power. Okay? There are questions of power which determine the selection and organization. Okay. Now, we read here selection and organization that must inevitably be a part of the formation of representations. Okay. Uh, therefore, as we see here representation as power entails both inclusion and exclusion of aspects of things. Then we, uh, we looked at um, Danny Cavallaro and his text critical and cultural theory uh, where, there, where we find um, the uh, uh, well written essay on representation, where he says that there is today a crisis okay, in representation. What does it mean to say that there is a crisis in representation? Mean, uh, uh, it means that representation has been rendered problematic. Okay. What does it mean uh, to, I may have mentioned this in one, in one of my earlier lectures, nevertheless, what does it mean for something to be problematized? Simply put, it means that we render okay, a concept or term or event or process problematic. We look at it as uh, you know uh, not, not uh, at face value. Okay. We understand, we begin to discover and then we realize okay, that there are many things that are hidden that need to be uncovered in certain topics. Okay, so and representation is one and hence he says that there is a crisis in representation and contemporary cultural studies seeks okay, to uh, seeks to highlight these uh, these crises in representation. Then uh, we also found and I will go through the recap uh, quickly that the concept of representation here the concept of representation is intimately connected with that of repetition. How is re repetition important? And then further down in the, in the last point you find that it could be argued that words for example, are representations which only acquire meaning to the extent that they may be repeated namely used in different contexts. Okay? It is uh, you can use the word currency, cultural currency. Okay? Any uh, thought, idea, concept, uh, any theory gains cultural currency only if it is repeated. So, repetition is uh, inherent in, uh, in, uh, in representation and uh, this is one of the first phase of realizing okay, that representation is not a simple uh, idea or concept that representation needs to be uh, you know sort of unpacked, needs to be queried. Hmm? needs to be questioned from several angles. Then rep next representations are also a vital means of supporting a cultural's ideology. Okay. Uh, we have already done, um, uh, 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 we have already discussed ideology in within this module, I think in the second uh, lecture if I am not mistaken second or third. In fact, there were two lectures de uh, devoted to ideology. And, uh, you will see that in cultural studies, these key concepts do, are not discrete concepts. Theorists discuss these concepts in relation to, to each other. I may have uh, in you know in this in um, 
the course of these lectures, you know, take, uh, you know taken up uh, topics and it may seem to some that it is a singular exercise, but it is not. Okay? Please remember that these are not for instance ideology, subjectivity, identity, representation, power, discourse. These are words that you cannot simply study in isolation. Okay? Every now and then and the more you relate and correlate them, the more dense, the more sophisticated, okay, the better theorized your, um, your answers are, your axioms are, in fact your understandings are. Okay. So, in this case representation is tied to ideology. Okay. Why? Now, if you look at you know uh, which representations are going to be upheld as you know uh, quote unquote the natural representations, only those which are supported and which are legitimized by ideology. Anything, any matter, any event, anything, any concept, uh, name it, can be represented from several, uh, uh, several, from several dimensions, from several aspects. Okay, and we need to understand that there are behind every, uh, you know, every um, sort of legitimized, hmm, every legitimized representation of anything, they are always the potential not used representations. So, this entails, this is also something that we had seen, this entails questioning, this is the word. Okay. To problematize, you need to question. Questioning many of the concepts and symbols, which we are generally invited to take for granted as timeless, objective and a matter of common sense. So, now we will, um, uh, this is the end of the recap and we are moving into the rest of what I want to tell you or show you about uh, you know and discuss about rep uh, you know representation. Cavallaro also mentions a very important point. Okay. He says, we do not talk only about representation tied to okay, or as a corollary to the word representation is you know its opposite okay, which is he says misrepresentation. Okay, says when you talk about representation, we cannot do uh, do away with. In fact, the very problematization, right, of of the term representation brings into discussion, okay, uh, its seeming opposite, right, misrepresentation. So let us read what Cavallaro has to say. Misrepresentation plays a central role in the construction of personal and collective identities. You would have thought or we would have thought that representation plays a central role. Here is Cavallaro suggesting and or in fact arguing that misrepresentation plays a central role okay, in the construction of our identities. What we think we are often is a product of how our culture sorry we are um, is a product of how our culture misrepresents us and how we misrepresent ourselves okay so it is as if you know all our representations all our pronouncements all our symbolic uh, sort of you know uh, symbolic reflections on ourselves are incorrect okay they uh, uh, the culture misrepresents us and in turn we end up misrepresenting ourselves. So, distortion is the next word. Distortion and misrepresentation are not secondary or accidental aspects of human experience. In fact, you many many might think that well okay, it is this uh, you know it is uh, representation is one thing and distortion is an aberration misrepresentation is an aberration, but Cavallaro says that you cannot even call it secondary or accidental representation. Okay? It is so much part and parcel uh, of the representative process. So, let me read this again. Distortion and misrepresentation are not secondary or accidental aspects of human experience. We do not perceive the world as it is, but rather as we have come across this word before, if you remember, mediated by various filters and channels, forms of language and forms of interpretation that do not mirror the world. Okay? So, this is, this, is, uh, this is almost established by now, I think, in our discussions. Okay. Forms of language and forms of inter, no, sorry of interpretation uh, do not mirror the world, they actually construct it. It is given to us not 
as the world uh, is or not as things are, they are mediated, they are channelized okay, through various symbolic forms, thereby he says perpetuating or challenging its ideologies. Right? So, therefore, these we find that uh, let us look at this slide, okay, you can remember it uh, better if this presented uh, diagrammatically or graphically, misrepresentation and distortion are equally important words. Um, words like the word representation is. Now, let us look at um, a, let us look at a book uh, called named uh, Key Concepts in Cultural Theory. This is another book those of you know it is um, it is like a glossary, but it is more, more than a glossary really it is um, you know sometimes they give the historical development of certain terms. Nevertheless, key concepts uh, that are used in theorizing culture. Are, are well written in these, uh, you know, or are rather written out well in this, uh, in this, in this book by Andrew Edgar and Peter Sedgwick. Now, they talk about representation in two ways. Okay, number one, from the point of view of language theories, okay, representation becomes a function of language. Right now, let's uh, see the way the way they have put it is a, the represent it is a representation of thoughts in language and b the linguistic representation of the world of empirical experience. First is the first step is we have thoughts and we couch them in a language. Okay? It is the language uh, as tool school of thought, okay? language is uh, a communicative tool school of thought okay? that looks um, at language simply as a as a carrier okay, of our thoughts. In that sense, representation could be uh, definitely defined as something that uh, uh, something that seeks to reflect okay, or represent our thoughts in language. In the second case, the ling uh, it is also representation is therefore the linguistic representation of the world of our empirical experience. On the other hand, in social terms, representation could have a political meaning. For instance, pressure groups, groups okay, re, num, a representing a group of people, hmm, representing a group of people, uh, maybe going to the government uh, to sub, to submit a memorandum. Okay, they are also a representation, and in social terms. And Secondly, representation also refers to the norms and practices representing social groups, etcetera. How you know you, you, you say that this this way of life, hmm, these socio cultural practices, these are representative of a particular group or a particular community. In that sense also we use the term representation in the sense of being representative, being the core uh, cultural artifacts, being the core uh, beliefs, being the core um, everyday practices of a society. Okay? However, having said this we need to also remember that it is, uh, it is point in the for in this case point B here. Okay, let us look at this slide. It is point B here that has received the most attention in the study of representation in cultural studies, okay, which is the linguistic representation of the world of our you know empirical experience. Okay, that the everything is represented in terms of language, language being the most common symbolic we may well argue the most common symbolic form. Okay. So, cultural studies at least the new cultural studies been talking about following the linguistic turn, okay, following post structuralism and post structuralism um, has posited uh, that uh, you know even culture is a language. Okay. These representations that we are talking about the norms and practices uh, for instance this last point the norms and practices for instance representing social groups are also or could be read as a language. Now, uh, having you know talked about that the linguistic turn a very important point comes to our mind and please look at this slide. The question does language reflect the world. Okay? Does language reflect the world 
or uh, you know uh, its related question if yes how far. Now, there are three theories here okay, which try to deal with the question does language reflect the world. Among these are number one the reflective theory or the reflective school of thought and next the intentional theory okay, and finally, the constructionist theory. Okay. So, remember the, the relation between language and the world language and reality are tried to be explained by three different theories and let us see how they try and work it out. Now, in this uh, you know we are take uh, you know uh, to explain this we are looking at a, a, an important essay by Stuart Hall. Uh, there is uh, you know um, an, an, a book edited by Hall which is uh, considered in cultural studies a seminal text for us okay and uh, we are looking at the essay there the work of representation in fact these three theories have been highlighted by stuart hall first hall says he talks about the reflective approach in the reflective approach meaning lies in the object or event in the real world okay that there in, in the real world in the world of objects actual objects in the material objects in the world of actual events okay actual phenomena that are happening okay those contain meaning hmm? so simply you just have to reflect right you reflect the meaning that is inherent according to this school inherent in an object or in the phenomenon in an event in the natural world in the real world in the tangible world and since the meaning is there you grasp the meaning and uh, you know you you represent it and you can say and you say hey this is um, this is a sort of true this is a faithful like a loyal representation of since the meaning is there I have tried to grasp it and represent it right. Now, let us look at the slide language in this case is a mirror or is considered a mirror that reflects the true meaning as it already exists in the world. It is also called the mimetic approach. Now, what is mimetic? You will uh, recall that mimetic comes from the word mimesis, which is a Greek word okay, which means to imitate. So, obviously, we this school, uh, this school holds that we only need to reflect as far as possible as truly as possible the meanings that are inherent in cultural phenomena in natural phenomena. Okay. Uh, the next approach as we know is the intentional approach and this is we will learn about it through, uh, through, through Stuart Hall's essay. Here the addresser, the addresser or the author imposes meaning on the world through language. So, here intention the intention of the author is important. So, it is not the meaning inherent the meaning inherent is filtered through the first time now this remember the filtering the mediation. Okay. Uh, the mediation and the filtering occurs here is that well the meaning uh, is there according to the reflective school, but the intentional uh, approach says that here you have an agent okay, through which an agent that is seeking right, to give you the meaning of the true representation the so called true representation, but the addresser also will in according to this please look at the slide the addresser or author imposes meaning on the world through language and importantly those words that he uses or she uses mean what the author intends them to mean the word intends hence the intention intentional approach. Okay. So, there we, therefore, we already have somebody who is there we have an agent and through the agent his or her choice of words and meanings and his or her intentions. Okay. Uh, they are important and our representation is all already so to speak mediated or channelized by the time it reaches us. Then we have the constructionist approach which is today considered you know um, uh, or, or an approach that is best suited to the understanding of not just representation to the understanding of cultural studies in general okay, to the understanding of so many things like power like discourse like ideology like subjectivity and identity. Now, let us look at the slide this is the constructionist approach as given to us by Stuart Hall. 
Now, this approach insists on the social character of language. Okay? Remember, we are now leaving the mimetic school. Okay? We are now leaving or coming away from the intentional school that is the intention of one person, okay, which is the author. Right? And we are going into the social aspect of language. The constructionist approach says as well, language does uh, you know is the vehicle for representation, but we have to understand the social character of language. Here, things do not mean we construct meaning using representational systems, concepts and signs. The material world and the symbolic or representational world are not the same. This is the you could say the final you know uh, this is a very important statement. Okay. It is the final you know uh, division or the delinking if you use the word this is the final delinking of the two domains. Hmm? The material world okay, and the representational world. I think a, a very radical thing to say when we consider you know when we consider philosophy, when we consider cultural studies, the material world and the symbolic world of representation are not the same. Now, let us look at the slide please. Though representation does use material objects okay, like images, sounds, bites etcetera, the meaning depends on the symbolic function of those objects. It is obvious okay, as, as we saw in, in Sosor, you saw in the lecture on structuralism in module 1. Okay. It is through sounds, it is through images that the message is conveyed. So, there is no doubting the fact that images, sounds and in the case of the digital world, by, world bytes are the carriers, okay. but the meaning depends on not again the images, the sounds, the bytes per se. Right? The meaning dep depends on the symbolic function of those objects. Finally, as Hall suggests, meaning through representation symbols is relational. Okay? Meaning is relational, you will again go, you know, we can go, you can refer to my lecture, to our lecture on structuralism, where we had discussed how meaning is relational in a chain if, you know, language is seen as a system. Or you know of differences, a system of relations, an arbi you know a system of arbitrary signs which are called words, okay, and meaning um, being in a systemic, right, both systemic and systematic comes about uh, you know in a system of relations with one another. So please remember that the constructionist approach is is the approach which today is understood as a uh, uh, you know a more sophisticated account of representation and what it is than the older uh, so to speak accounts like the you know the approaches like the reflectionist approach and the intentional approach therefore now we need to you know uh, further theorize it and we need to understand these the last one the constructionist approach as being a non ontological approach okay now we again come across you, you recall that we have come across the word uh, ontological over and over again okay and uh, we need to use this word because ontology is a is a, a, you know is has been a very powerful uh, powerful school of thought in philosophy uh, which sees things as inherently you know having meaning or uh, you know see, sees things in terms of you know essences that things have right okay so it is important for us to realize that the constructionist approach the constructionist approach is a non ontological one okay so let's relate it to the three approaches so the first approach if we say that uh, now can we call it ontological definitely the first approach is or uh, the reflectionist approach is ontological why because it has said that objects remember objects events phenomena practices are where meanings reside okay you simply have to uh, you know uh, uh, be able to faithfully represent them okay so representation is finally non ontological because it is here yeah, social it is constructed, it is relational and it is symbolic. Okay. So, by now I think we have uh, discussed this enough. 
which is a constructed uh, bit of it and in some other uh, slides I may come back to it as some other, other critics have talked about it. Now, again Stuart Hall, Stuart Hall if you look at the slide, Stuart Hall says that both representation and culture are to do you know or have to do with shared meanings. Remember again meaning is an important term, meaning is an important concept in cultural studies okay, after the linguist turn uh, especially right. Uh, our uh, you know our focus ultimately as uh, practitioners of cultural studies would be to see how meaning is created. Now, in Stuart Hall's terms therefore, both representation and culture okay, um, try to, uh, you know is a matter of shared meanings, meanings that you and I share, meanings as, as members of a community share. Now, what is important here is that meanings are shared all right, but meanings are not shared across cultures. Okay? So, that this is a very important point that Hall raises and other critics, other cultural theorists raise is that they are shared meanings all right, but let us not assume that meanings across all cultures are going to be shared. Now, language therefore, is a represent now to summarize these points, language is a representational system and the medium of perception and understanding. Now, we come to uh, an important theoretical formulation given by Stuart Hall in the same work and this is something that uh, almost all um, you know uh, all instructors of cultural studies would bring to your, to your notice. Now, I am quoting from Hall, our circuit of culture, this is what I wanted to bring to you, our circuit of culture suggests that in fact, meanings are produced at several sites. Okay. Till now, we, uh, we thought that meanings are produced as representations, meanings are produced uh, through language, meanings are produced to symbolization, but Hall gives us an important uh, you know uh, uh, an, an important it is almost an, like an important breakthrough in the sense that he says meanings are produced at several different sites and please look at this sli slide circulated through several different processes or practices. So, let us you know uh, do away with the illusion that meaning is something that comes to us from only one medium or comes to us from medium of language all right, but he would say next when you talk about the circuit of culture that meaning uh, pro is produced at different sites not only pro not only sites here, but meaning is circulated to us through different processes or practices. This is a further problematization and a further formulation of representation. So, meaning is constantly being produced and exchanged in every personal and social interaction in which we take part. Now, the, the interesting thing here is that it is not that meanings are given to us by books, it is not that meanings are given to us by scriptures or, mean, or that meanings are given to us by canonical works, meaning creation okay, and the understanding of meaning, if you may use the word the negotiation of meaning is something that happens every day. Okay? Now, let us look at this key sentence again, meaning is constantly being produced and exchanged in every personal and social interaction that we take part. So, what is uh, you know what is the lesson that we learn here? The lesson that we learn here or the important point is this that meaning is always fluid, meaning is always flexible. As many conversation acts that you have right uh, you, you you take part in uh, in any social as many social interactions you take part in it looks like meaning is as it, as it says here constantly produced and exchanged okay this is something that uh, i would say very few um, theorists have said they have theorists have talked about meaning you know being produced they may have even talked about meaning being produced uh, not through one side but in several sites agreed they may have also said that there are different processes you know of meaning production but tying down meaning to everyday practices and you know the 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 reproducibility 
of meaning and the you know constant change and and uh, and uh, the constant production and exchange of meaning happening in almost every single social interaction and conversation is um, something that Hall has brilliantly given us. Now, this is Hall's circuit of culture, uh, of culture okay. So, we will go back again and see what is the circuit of culture. The circuit of culture suggests that meanings are produced at different sites. Now, this is the circuit of culture. Okay. So, it is not therefore, enough for us to talk only about representation it is not enough for us to stop there. We are going to look at processes, we are going to look at sites and the moment we remember I had said that in cultural studies and even if you talk about you know uh, key concepts, even if you devote separate lectures to the key concepts, in the end you have to tie these down together, you have to talk about this in relation to one another. Why? Because if you do not do that the entire point of cultural studies is lost, okay, that things are inextricably uh, you know um, related or sometimes even blended with one another. Therefore, in the circuit of culture apart from representation what is important are the regulation. Okay. Regulations here are not simply rules in the sense that you understand rules and regulations. Regulation here refers particularly to the regulation of meaning, okay. the regulation of meaning. As long as we have ideology, as long as we have power, as long as we have discourse and the power of discourse, okay, meaning will always uh, you know be regulated by the dominant agencies okay. and at the same time right, regulated meaning will always be uh, challenged by people who are challenging the dominant ideology. So, look at I mean, therefore, if you talk about representation you definitely cannot do without talking uh, do uh, uh, by talking with uh, or without talking about the regulation of meaning. Then obviously, this also ties. So, it would go like this you know they are so interrelated right. Each is related to the other. So, how in that case identity or even you know uh, even subjectivity, identity, consumption. Now, well, we have representation. Okay, then we have the regulation of meaning. This doesn't have, this doesn't take place as simply an exercise. We also consume meaning. Now, by now, you, I'm sure you probably you have understood how these words are related to one another. Okay, representation and the regulation of meaning, the creation of identity, the consumption of meaning. Okay, the contestation of meaning, uh, then uh, of course, before consumption the, the production of meaning, okay. these are uh, related say inextricably bound with questions of representation. Okay. So, this again is a brilliant move on uh, the part of Stuart Hall, Hall's member, Hall's circuit of culture and what are the components of Hall's circuit of culture, representation, regulation, identity, production and consumption. Therefore, ways of producing meaning and communicating meaning work like languages. Okay. So, even, even the whole circuit of culture that we were talking about uh, uh, you know just before this, um, the, the entire process of production of meaning, of communicating meaning, of regulating meaning and thereby creating identities and contestations, creating uh, you, know, you know producing uh, meaning and finally, consuming meaning. All these work like languages or rather all these work in a system of difference all these work in a system of uh, a certain uh, degree of arbitrariness and all these work in a system of uh, relationality and differentiation. Now, uh, you may think that well okay, they work like languages, is it because they are simply you know they are simply written uh, they are simply verbal or the, you know they are written or they are spoken is it why they work like languages. No, as is given here uh, by the theorists not because they are you know these things meanings work like la you know uh, like language if you look at the slide before this ways of producing meaning and communicating meaning work like languages not uh, let us read they are not because they are written or spoken 
but because they all use some element to stand for or represent what we want to say, to express or communicate a thought, concept, idea or feeling. The language of the body uses physical gesture, the language of look at this the language of the body. Okay. The body does not you know the language of the body is not done in words, but still we talk about it in terms of a language you know we talk about body language. In that sense as he says it is not simply that it is it has to be in a verbal medium or that it has to be written and spoken. We have to understand language in a slight, slightly broader way for in a clear example here given is for instance when we use language uh, you know in, in the sense of talking about body language or the language of the body. The language of the body uses physical gestures, the language of facial expressions uses ways of arranging one's features you know to mean something to, to convey meaning. Television uses digitally or electronically produced dots on the screen, traffic lights Okay. Now, traffic lights use red, green and amber. Look at this example for instance, okay. could we not talk about the language of the traffic system. Okay. If I talk to you about the language and I said this is the language of the traffic system, it means what? It means that the, the traffic system uh, signals traffic signal system that we all use which are you know which is common al almost across uh, you know uh, uh, at least to a huge extent across the globe is a language that operates through difference. It is a language that operates through relationality. Uh, you remember in the example in, in, in Saussure's case we had said that uh, they, there may not be something ontological okay, essential in the colors red, green and amber, red, amber and green, but through a system of difference of red being not amber, okay, amber being not green and, uh, and so on and so forth. What happens is the system may be called a language, why? Because it communicates. In this case, it is not in the verbal medium, right? it is not written or spoken it is in the in the case of colors, but colors are used here as a language. So, whether it is a language of the body, whether it is the language of uh, you know of, of, um, of the facial expressions, uh, whether it is uh, the language of bytes okay, b y t e s language of bytes okay, in the digital world, whether it is the traffic system. Okay. Their, look at this slide, their importance for language is not what they are but what they do. Okay. When you talk about things as they are, you are talking about ontology. Remember, cultural studies is if not out and out, it is in the ultimate analysis a non-ontological one. Okay. It is a non-mimetic one, a non-reflectionist one. The, that's, and therefore, it says the importance here for all these language systems. right? Uh, is that they uh, it is not important what they are in themselves, but it is important as uh, you know what is important is what they do okay? the function the fact and in this case they all function like a language. Okay? Then further Stuart Hall says meaning and representation seem to belong irrevocably to the interpretive uh, interpretative side of the human and cultural science whose subject matter society, culture, the human subject is not amenable to a positivistic approach. This is the important point here. Okay. It is not amenable to a positivistic approach. Okay. As Hall says, meaning and representation seem to belong irrevocably to the interpretative side of the human and cultural uh, science whose subject matter, society, culture and the human subject is not amenable to a positivistic approach. Look at the word interpretative versus the word positivistic. Okay. Uh, when you talk in, in terms of theory, these are diametrically opposed in the sense that if you have a positivistic approach, it means that you have something definite to say about okay, any phenomenon it is measurable right it is measurable it is quantifiable okay so that you have something scientific so called scientific or definite 
definitive to say or definite to say. On the other hand, when you look at interpretive, you know what this is a point that he is making meaning and representation. So, look at the word irrevocably, you cannot you know they are irrevocable in the sense that you cannot you know once uh, you understand uh, uh, you know the way it is in the it is uh, you know uh, you cannot revoke it in the sense that you cannot cannot take away that very quality that is there. Okay. Meaning and representation belong seem to belong irrevocably to the interpretative side of the human and cultural sciences. There are many interpretations to phenomena. phenomena okay. This is the anti positivistic school of thinking right uh, versus the positivistic school as we just saw which says which sing which uh, believes so to speak that we can use science and you can measure and quantify everything. The interpretative school of representation of meaning production okay, even perhaps even, even consumption would on the other hand say that interpretation is all. So, there is no one interpretation. The moment you say that there is one interpretation or one representation or one true definite you know inter, uh, representation of something, something that is backed by positivism, something that is backed by measurability quantifiability you are then doing an act of power okay and you are what you call cancelling out okay you're cancelling out other aspects other or you could say competing representations which which may not be or are not right quantifiable and measurable so we read on again the necessarily interpretative nature of culture and the fact that interpretations never produce this is important in this this is the role of interpretation this is what interpretation is and this is what interpretation does not uh, you know uh, uh, does not apologize for being is this please look at the slide interpretations never produce a final moment of absolute truth interpretation uh, the interpretative approach to representation okay holds asserts and argues that you can never produce a final absolute truth and there is also never a moment of absolute truth. Okay. Instead let us read on instead interpretations are always followed by other interpretations in an endless chain. You as practitioners as people who seek to understand cultural studies would have to begin to think in these ways. Okay. It may seem you know uh, that we you know we are mostly perhaps you know even in our school life right taught in a more or less positivistic manner that this is this, this phenomenon is this etcetera. When we move on to these higher realms of understanding then we have to, to definitely accommodate the interpretative approach okay, which says that every interpretation will be followed by other interpretations in an endless chain. Right. And secondly, let us look at this any notion, okay, any notion, any idea of a final meaning is always endlessly put off or deferred. Okay. This has of course, words like deferred, words, words like endless chain are from the post structuralist school, particularly the theoretical formulations by Jacques Derrida. Okay. So, this, this is this kind of thinking, this kind of theorizing is uh, directly affected or directly could say inspired if you will by the pronouncements by, by people like Jacques Derrida. Any notion of a final meaning is always endlessly put off or deferred. Cultural studies of this interpretative kind or you know studies even of representation for instance of this kind like other qualitative forms of sociological inquiry are inevitably caught up in the circle of meaning. Okay. There is a circle of meaning, uh, there is a certain uh, or circularity to it that you cannot avoid, and you better uh, celebrate these kind of you know endless uh, you know deferrals of meaning. We will talk about this uh, later on, and we uh, would also would like to show that this is not okay. This does not mean irresponsibility. That uh, it nor does it mean you know the accommodation of uh, you know ridiculous or outlandish kind of explanations. Okay. There is a certain logic, uh, logic to what is being said here. Uh, the giving up of responsibility 
you know, when one enters into this sort of an understanding or this kind of a theor theorizing, um, the giving up of responsibility is something that, uh, that is that would not be done by a true scholar. A true scholar would understand this language, representation, okay, other aspects of culture as being uh, you know characterized by this quality of interpretativeness of interpretation and the deferral of meaning. Such a scholar who understands it as a systemic feature will not you know it is a poor scholar who takes it upon himself or herself to be irresponsible okay, both in one's theorizing and in one's living in one's living okay, by taking off from this. Now, this is to be understood as I said as something that is part of the system that is systematic. Therefore, anti-positivism okay, interpretation and the unfinalizability uh, of meaning and endless deferral, these are part and parcel of the representation process and of cult culture in general. Um, I will take you back, if you have problems with this kind of formulations, as it is obvious many people have problems with this kind of formulations of it simply the interpretative or of you know or, um, uh, or, or of endless deferral of meanings. One of the ways out is given to us by Chris Barker. And I may have talked about this in, in you know in module one. Nevertheless, it's important for us to to uh, to realize it. He says uh, that given this whole problem, okay, of endless deferral of meaning, one way out would be. He says I am thus I am. Uh, let's look at this slide here, please. Thus I am recommending an approach that recasts problems away from an emphasis on representation. Now, it is you may think that well here is Chris Barker who is, um, who is a, a practitioner of cultural studies, who theorizes on culture, who agrees that representation is, is, a, is a very important part of cultural studies and here he is telling us that we should move away from an emphasis on representation. He is not telling us here to move away from representation as a key concept per se. What he is saying is that you know instead of uh, you know following the endless deferral of interpretations uh, you know ad infinitum even ad nauseum he is saying that we will then have to recast the problems of culture of cultural studies of cultural practices by you know coming away from an emphasis and here I would say an over emphasis you can even couch it in that language an over emphasis on representation particularly representation from the linguistic turn point of view that is the question what is to the more mundane and pragmatic issues. For instance, how do we talk about x and for what purposes? Now, here in, in this case you would you know um, uh, Barker would insist that instead of asking which you no know, instead of ask, uh, uh, asking whether this representation is is true, whether this is you know ontologically the representation that we should take. There are many questions behind this, there are many questions of ideology, power of discursive practices, okay, of politics behind this. Then he says one way is you know to avoid that ad infinitum talking about representation is we also please look at this, we also ask this question for what purposes are we talking about it. Okay. So, this look at this word here pragmatism, there is a certain pragmatism in the end. After all, we cannot discuss things like representation in abstraction all the time. We have lives to live out, okay. we have li to carry on with our work, we have to carry on with our cultural practices, we have to carry out with our everyday lives and that is why sometimes no, we just we do not throw the baby out with the bath water. We say that representation is yes again representation is a pillar of cultural studies, but we also need to bring in the element of pragmatism and of asking questions like when we are talking about x or when you are talking about any phenomenon or event or object, we need to ask for what purposes are we talking about. That is one way of what? That is one way of um, avoiding the pitfalls, okay? avoiding the pitfalls of talking in say, uh, talking uh, you know uh, 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 talking continuously about the deferral of meaning. 
Therefore, what sometimes uh, something is becomes constituted by the use of language within specific language games. Language games is what we had discussed with remember we talked about Wittgenstein I think in the first or second lecture in, 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 in module 1 where uh, entitled um, understanding cultural studies okay, and we talked uh, uh, a bit on language games and um, I urge you to refer to those lectures further to understand what is meant here. Uh, by talk, thinking of language from a pragmatic point of view okay, as language games. Then he says this therapeutic recasting of the question, okay, the, look at the word so telling this therapeutic, why is it therapeutic? Okay, because it uh, you know it after all this the whole business of cultural studies has to be something that gives us uh, understanding an understanding which is therapeutic for our purposes. Okay. So, this therapeutic recasting of the question what is cultural studies into an inquiry about how we talk. So, it is a movement from what to how, how we talk about cultural studies enables us to see that cultural studies is not an object. Okay, the more if you keep talking about it all the time in terms of representation and deferral then we are objectifying cultural studies as well. So, let us now come to the discussion and the questions and say number 1, well if uh, you get a question like this, why is misrepresentation an important concept within, uh, within representation studies, okay, which seems seemingly an opposite, but it is an important concept. The answer is misrepresentation plays a central role in the construction of personal and collective identities okay, and it shows us how culture rep misrepresents us and how we end up also misrepresenting ourselves. A uh, uh, kindred uh, term here is distortion and distortion and misrepresentations are as argued by Danny Cavallaro not secondary, they are not aberrations or distractions, okay. they are part and parcel of the representation process. Next what according to Stuart Hall are the three approaches to representation okay, and particularly to the question does language reflect the world, the three are reflective approach, the intentional approach and the constructionist approach. Right? Question number 3, how is the constructionist approach non-ontological? The constructionist that the third, the constructionist approach is non-ontological because it talks about uh, representation, about culture, about reality, about knowledge as things that are social and not individual okay, or not mimetic uh, as meaning and representation as being constructed as symbolic and relational in a system to other things. Okay. So, this is non-ontological and it, that is it is non-essential. What does Stuart Hall mean by the circuit of culture? By the circuit of culture he means that, that things are not elements of culture are not to be seen in their singularity or not to be seen as discrete terms. The circuit of culture is such that representation, regulation, consumption, the production okay, and finally, identity and, and perhaps even some other terms here okay, we could add here and improvise on it are or they act in a whole circuit. right? It is again part of a system in which you cannot talk about representation without talking about the regulation of meaning, you cannot talk about the regulation of meaning without talking about identity, you cannot talk about consumption without talking about how meaning is produced in the first place, how things are represented in the first place. Okay. Our circuit of culture as Hall says suggests that in fact meanings are produced at different sites and are circulated through different processes or practices, you recall we had uh, um, talk, talked about this. This is um, what we have discussed in our, uh, you know, in our deliberations on representation and let me hasten to add again, like, like all the other concepts, okay, uh, it is impossible to exhaust all, uh, you know, the different shades, the different, uh, you know, the different um, uh, uh, formulations on representation. In fact, you could even have a, you know, whole 40 lecture series on representation itself. However, my aim here in this core, in this lecture and in the lecture before this was or has been to bring to you uh, a you know the the way, uh, way it is understood, the way representation is understood in contemporary cultural studies, and b by talking about 
um, uh, practitioners like Stuart Hall, like Danny Cavallaro and by using certain formulations like the circuit of culture and of you know of pragmatism. Uh, I, uh, I hope I have been able to just you know uh, unpack a bit of what it means to be studying representation in cultural studies and uh, maybe in some other, other lectures in other modules the representation would come up again. Uh, but um, for now, I hope this has been um, uh, has been a useful uh, discussion with you. Thank you so much.